This is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. It's Thursday, May 21st, 10 o'clock. Uh, thank you, everyone. Good to see you again. And uh, so uh, we are going to be turning now to the Global Warming Solutions Act. Uh, everyone should have received a hard copy. Thank you, Mr. Martland, for getting that out to us because it's a lot easier to use paper and Zoom rather than look at a long document and attend a Zoom session at the same time. At least on my end, it is. So that's H688, um, and uh, we'll uh, turn it over I'm, to Mr. Martin. Sorry, Senator Bray, I just want to clarify. Yes. Did you say by a hard copy, nothing, did, was something sent in the, the actual mail, or are we just talking about email? Uh, we got actual United States Postal Service mail. Hmm. Uh, mine arrived yesterday. I don't know if you have not received uh, your copy. Once, ag once again, Mr. Martland is leaving me off of the Christmas list. <laughs> Uh, no, I will. I will go and see if in Massachusetts. Yes, please begin. Check. It. I, I don't know if you looked at your mail since yesterday, but uh, hopefully yeah, we uh, all got one. I will take a look. Okay. Um, it also. Uh, I just double check with Jude. Jude, this bill six eighty eight is uh, posted on our committee page. Is it not? Yes, yes, it is. Great. All right. So that's a backup for Senator Campion and for anyone who's um, streaming. Great. Take With that, that back, I posted uh, Luke's PowerPoint. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I'll check and get back to you. I think I did. Okay. So uh, at any rate, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Martland, we'll do a walkthrough of H688. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. For the record, this is Luke Marland, the Director of Legislative Council and Chief Counsel to the General Assembly. And today I'll do a walkthrough of H688, the Vermont Global Warming Solutions Act. Can everyone hear me okay? If you can't, please let me know. This is the first time this committee has taken up this bill. So today I'll do more of a general or a high level walkthrough of the bill. I won't read the bill page by page to you. There'll be some sections I gloss over or only spend a little bit of time on. And there'll be other sections that I drill down on and uh, discuss the language in more depth. I anticipate this might be only the first of many meetings. I anticipate that there'll be sections of the bill or issues that you want further discussion concerning. And so we can always go back and look at something in more depth if you wish. I will be showing you a PowerPoint in a moment. And what I would suggest is if you have the paper copy of the bill, you have the paper copy next to you, and then you are watching the PowerPoint on the screen. And as always, if there's any questions, please ask. I'll let the chair moderate those questions and recognize you. But I always say that when I'm appearing in your committee, and I think with the Zoom meetings, they're always a little slower, a little uh, less efficient. So please ask questions if you don't understand anything I've said or if you want to uh, follow up on anything I mentioned. So before I jump in and pull up the PowerPoint, are there any questions at this point? And should we wait for Senator Campion to come back? Uh, please begin. Thank you. I'm back. Would, Thank you, Did Luke. you receive the paper it. copy? I received Great. it. I received your card as well in the chocolates. Thank you. I'm sure everybody so let me that. now pull up the PowerPoint and we'll begin to walk through the bill. And please don't hesitate to ask questions as we do that. So all of you should see the PowerPoint on your screen now. Uh, as I indicated earlier, this is H688, the Vermont Global Warming Solution Act. And let's begin by giving you a table of contents, if you will, of how the bill is organized. It's broken down into different sections using what we call the reader's assistance, which is basically those three ellipses with a heading. That is not legal language. It is no legal import, but it helps organize the bill. Section one is a short title. Section two are legislative findings. And I don't intend to read those to you 
or go through them in any depth. We certainly can later. But uh, at this point, I think it might be a better use of time to move on and look at section three, which is the first substantive legal section of the bill. And this establishes mandatory greenhouse gas reduction requirements. Section four is the real meat of the bill. And this creates a new chapter in Title 10 that has sections concerning definitions, that creates the Vermont Climate Council and sets forth the duties of that council, that establishes the Vermont Climate Action Plan and sets forth what that plan must contain. In section 593, there's language concerning rulemaking by ANR. And finally, there's a cause of action in the new section 594. So section four with these new sections of law is really the meat of the bill. And that's what we'll spend most of the time discussing today. In sections five and six, there's some supplemental language concerning the rulemaking process and the appointment of council members. In section seven and eight, there's amendments to current law concerning the state energy policy and energy plan. In sections nine and 10, there's language concerning appropriation and new positions. And then finally, the effective date in section 11. And we'll go back in a few moments and begin to walk through these sections one by one. Before we do that, I wanna give you a visual of how this bill is intended to work. And if you keep that visual in your mind, it might make it easier to understand how the pieces fit together. First of all, the bill creates mandatory greenhouse gas reduction targets tied to three key years, 2025, 2030, and 2050. Second, it establishes a Vermont Climate Council that will develop a plan to achieve those greenhouse gas reduction requirements. ANR engages in rulemaking to implement the plan and achieve those requirements. And then finally, if ANR fails to engage in rulemaking or those rules don't achieve those mandatory reduction requirements, there's a cause of action. So if you think of this bill overall, it establishes the emission reduction requirements, creates a council, which develops a plan, ANR engages in rulemaking to implement the plan. And if that does not succeed, you have a cause of action. Let's begin by looking at page one of your paper copy of the bill. Uh, section one is a short title. I've already given you that short title. And section two, which begins on page one and then continues on to page three, is the a legislative finding. And as I indicated earlier, I don't intend to read you those legislative findings. We certainly can uh, talk about them in more depth later. You may wish to drill down on them and even change them. But for right now, I would suggest we move on to section three, which is the greenhouse gas reduction requirement section. Uh, Mr. Martling, can I ask a quick yes. question about sure. how, how the bill came over? Thanks. So, sure. uh, and I don't want to get stuck there. I just want to know, uh, section nine, the appropriation of $972,000 to fund the project, is, was, is that in any current budget? or is that a, a future anticipated expense? I'm just wondering if this has been provided. I don't, I don't believe that's in uh, any budget for right now. As you know, the when this was written, we weren't in the COVID situation, so they're anticipating a big bill to cover all of FY21, and now they're proceeding differently. So I don't believe that had been put in the big bill at that time. Uh, that appropriation is actually intended to cover two years, so it's a little unusual. Okay, great, thanks. I don't want to sidetrack us. I just wanted to know if there was the money was traveling with the bill. The money, the money is not separately uh, put in a, a budget, as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, looking at section three, this amends existing law. Under current law, ten VSA five seventy eight establishes goals for the state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions as follows. Compared to the 1990 baseline to reduce emissions by 2012 by 25%, by 2028, 50%, and by 
and by 2050, 75% if practicable using reasonable efforts. That's existing law. What this bill does is amend that law to make those reductions mandatory and in their proportion I set forth on the slide. But let's go and look at the actual language in your paper copy of the bill. So section three begins on the bottom of page three and it states at the bottom of page three, greenhouse gas reduction requirements. So this is now mandatory. At the very last line of page three, Vermont shall reduce emissions of greenhouse gases from within the boundaries of the state and those emissions outside the boundaries of the state caused by the use of energy in Vermont, that's all existing language, as measured and inventory pursuant to section 5A2 of this title. That's a cross reference to 10 VSA 5A2, which requires ANR to publish the Vermont greenhouse gas emission inventory, which they do periodically. I'm now on page four. You'll see number one says, not less than 26% from the 2005 greenhouse gas emissions by January 1st, 2025. Then there's language pursuant to the state's membership in the Climate Alliance. So this is not changing those reduction amounts or proportions. It's just tying it to Vermont's membership in this alliance and its commitment under the Paris Agreement. Number two, not less than 40% from the 1990 greenhouse gas emissions by January 1st, 2030. And number three, not less than 80% from the 1990 greenhouse gas emissions by January 1st, 2050. Just for your reference, the amount of the 1990 emissions, that baseline, was approximately 8.65 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. That's a measurement uh, that's often used. And in 2005, which is under number one as a comparison year, it had risen to approximately 10.22 million metric tons. And this is from ANR data, but you should absolutely check with them to make sure I'm accurate. And these numbers are sometime adjusted uh, as they do more analysis. So there are quantifiable numbers as to 1990 and as to 2005. And under the bill, these are the mandatory reduction amounts compared to those baseline years. Quick question on the using different baseline years. Is, is the use of 2005 because the Paris Agreement in general used 2005 as a baseline? So we're just keeping Vermont language in line with the Paris Agreement? baseline year? That is my understanding, yes. Okay. Thank you. And as I indicated, the 2005 baseline was substantially higher than the 1990 levels. So now this section, section three, and this section of law, 10 VSA 578, will be cross-referenced repeatedly throughout the bill. So as we go through the bill, you'll see over and over language pursuant to section 578 of this title, it's referring to this section of law. And I also would alert you to that later on, we'll be talking about net zero. So you'll see that these requirements max out at 80% in below the 1990 levels in 2050. You'll see later on in the bill on page 13 and then on page 20, there'll be uh, the concept of net zero, which is a little different, but I just wanna give you a heads up. We'll discuss that a little later. So once again, section three sets the mandatory greenhouse gas reduction requirements. Are there any questions about this section of the bill? Okay. So moving on to section four. So we now have set the baseline requirements for the mandatory reduction. And now we begin to get into section four. Section four creates a new chapter 24 in title 10. This would be chapter 24, Vermont Climate Council and Climate Action Plan. 
Now, just so you know, if you ever were to pull a green buckle off the shelf or look at the statutes online, there already is a chapter 24 pertaining to outdoor lighting, but that was repealed in 2009. So what this basically does is eliminate that repealed law and any reference to it and create a new chapter 24 pertaining to the Vermont Climate Council and the Vermont Climate Action Plan. So the first section of this new chapter is 10 VSA 590 with definitions. And if you're looking at your paper copy of the bill, this is on page five. And it defines terms such as adaptation, mitigation, and resilience. By the way, you'll notice that resilience is given number five. That's a typo. It should be number four. We can fix that if you make any amendments to this bill going forward. The terms adaptation, mitigation, and resilience are not really legal terms, but it defines them because they're used repeatedly throughout the rest of the bill. You'll see that greenhouse gas is defined in two as cross-referencing the same meaning as section 552 of this title. And I put the definition, this is existing law, the current definition of greenhouse gas under 10 VSA 552. And it includes any chemical or physical substance that is emitted into the air and that the secretary of A&R may reasonably anticipate to cause or contribute to climate change, including substances such as carbon dioxide, methane, and some other listed substances. So obviously greenhouse gas is a term that will be used repeatedly throughout the bill, and it is cross-referenced as the current definition in 10 VSA 552. Um, Mr. Martling, can you say just a little bit more when you, <clears throat> You know, when we put in definitions, you were saying something about these definitions like adaptation, mitigation, resilience, not having legal meaning, but our, I always think of our definitions section as creating legal meaning for the, for any bill. So sure. I, maybe I'm not quite following. Yeah, I'm sorry if I was unclear. I didn't say legal meaning, I said legal term. And what I meant was it's not a specific legal term like some definitions are but those words were defined in this context because they're used repeatedly. So it does have a, a legal impact and make sure every time you read that word in the rest of the bill, yep. it has that clear meaning to you, but it's not a, um, a legal term like you see in some other statutes. Is that helpful? Sure, sure. Yeah. I don't know, Mr. Chair, if it means, if it really, in the end, it, it's exactly the same result, if that helps you at all. Any uh, questions about the definition section? Moving on then to the new 10 VSA 591, which concerns the Vermont Climate Council. And I'll be walking through the next few pages, pages six, seven, eight, and nine in some detail, because this sets forth the composition and the duties and responsibilities of the Vermont Climate Council. But before we walk through that line by line, here's a quick overview. There'll be 22 members, eight are from the executive branch, seven are appointed by the House, and seven appointed by the Senate. And the duties and deliverables of the Council include, at a high level, identifying and analyzing and evaluating the appropriate strategies and programs to achieve those mandatory greenhouse gas reductions, to adopt the Vermont Climate Action Plan. There's also language including measurement of various things. And there's language concerning guidance to ANR concerning its rulemaking obligations. There are various subcommittees. There are four that are required and the council can establish other subcommittees. And then there's language concerning supporting the council and reports that the council must issue. So that's the table of contents of section 591. And now we'll go back and begin to walk through it in more detail. If everyone goes to page six of your paper copy, you'll see that section 591 begins with a list of the members. As I noted already, there's 22 total members and under subsection A, the first eight listed 
are from the executive branch. They include under one, the secretary of administration who shall serve as the chair of the council. Number two, the secretary of natural resources, the secretary of agriculture, commerce and community development, human services, transportation, public safety, and the Department of Public Service. Nine on page six states that the following members shall be appointed by the Speaker of the House. And they include a member with expertise and professional experience in the design and implementation of programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, a member to represent rural communities, municipal governments, distribution utilities, in other words, electric utilities, to represent a statewide environmental organization, the fuel sector, and G on page seven, one member with expertise in climate change science. All of these are once again appointed by the Speaker of the House. On page seven, you'll see 10, the following members shall be appointed by the committee on committees, in other words, the Senate. A, a member in the expertise in the design and implementation of programs to increase resilience and respond to natural disasters. B, representing the clean energy sector, small business community, Vermont Community Action Partnership, the farm and forest sector, a youth member, and under G, one member of a Vermont-based organization with expertise in energy and data analysis. So those members would be appointed by the Senate. Are there any questions about the members and their qualifications? Going on to page um, just, I'm just I'm trying to scan the whole list, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. To myself, uh, Senator McDonald, please go ahead. I'm, I'm scanning the whole list and um, out of the 22 members, there seems to be a, a member with expertise in the design and implementation of programs um, having to do with climate change and the other 20 members are not, don't, that's the only one with that skill? That's rhetorical question, one, thank you. That's the only one that's specified to have that skill, yes. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Proceeding to page seven, subsection B. So we've gone through the list of members and who will appoint those members. Now we're moving on to the duties and deliverables of the council. B states that the council shall identify, analyze, and evaluate strategies and programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, achieve the state's reduction requirements pursuant to section 578, that's a cross-reference I explained to you earlier, the greenhouse gas reduction requirements, and build resilience to prepare the state's communities, infrastructure, and economy to adapt to the current and anticipated effects of climate change including, if you flip to page eight, creating an inventory of all existing programs that impact emissions and their efficacy. B, evaluating and analyzing the technical feasibility and cost effectiveness of existing strategies and programs and identifying, evaluating, and analyzing new strategies and programs. And C, analyzing each source or category of sources of greenhouse gas emissions and identifying which strategies and programs will result in the largest greenhouse gas emissions reductions in the most cost-effective manner. In other words, the biggest bang for the buck. D, identifying, analyzing, and evaluating public and private financing strategies to support the transition to reduced greenhouse gas emissions economy. And E, evaluating and analyzing existing strategies and programs that build resilience and identifying, evaluating, and analyzing new strategies and programs 
to prepare the state for the impacts of climate change. So these are five factors, five high level factors that the council shall look at in its process of identifying, analyzing, and evaluating strategies and programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. On page eight, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll see that secondly, the council will develop a plan. So at the bottom of page eight, number two, on or before December 1st, 2021, the council will adopt Vermont Climate Action Plan and update the plan every four years thereafter. And we'll talk about the plan in more detail in a few moments in an another section of the law. But on page eight, it states that the plan will set forth the specific initiatives, programs, and strategies that the state shall pursue to reduce emissions and achieve the mandatory reduction requirements. Going on to page nine. So the council is obligated once again, as we began, to identify, analyze, and evaluate strategies and programs under the five factors we looked at, to develop a plan and update it every four years. And now on page nine, number three, identify the means to accurately measure the state's greenhouse gas emissions and progress towards meeting the reduction requirements. B, the effectiveness of the initiatives, programs, and strategies set forth in the plan. C, the effect of climate change on the state's climate, wildlife, and natural resources. D, the resilience of the state's communities. So the measurement duty imposed on the council is not just measuring greenhouse gas emissions, but it's measuring its progress towards the goals, the effectiveness of the programs that it recommends, the effect of climate change on the state and the resilience of the state's communities. So the measurement obligation and duties are multifaceted. Number four, the council is also required to provide guidance to the Secretary of Natural Resources concerning the form, content, and subject matter of the rules to be adopted pursuant to section 593 of this chapter. That section is on page 18 and we'll discuss it in a few moments. So the council must provide guidance to a &R as to a &R's rulemaking obligation. We've now reviewed the duties and deliverables of the council. And we'll talk about some of these in more detail when we get to the plan. But are there any questions so far? This is not so much a question that we need to dig into, um, but I'm just wondering it, on number four on page nine, providing guidance to a and R. Are there other precedents in state law um, where we have a panel, majority composition, unelected officials providing guidance to an agency of state government. I'll just leave that as a question to get back to. BSNAP used to be. Pardon me, Senator McDonald. I didn't quite catch it. The, the Vermont State Nuclear Advisory Panel used to provide such guidance to state government when it was in existence. Okay. And what I will be doing is as you raise issues, I'll try to take notes. And I, if you also do that, that might be helpful, but I'll be trying to take notes of these type of questions. Thank you. So I don't wanna, just wanted to flag that while we go because, it, Thank you. So let's, I think you were gonna go on to sub C, right? Yes, I'll go on now to sub C, which concerns the subcommittees. But before I do that, any other questions about what we've just covered? I guess uh, I do have one more that a back up in 3A in terms of measuring emissions. Um, uh, we, we have a protocol now, is there, a, can you speak a little bit to the, since you helped 
participate in the writing of the bill, was there a sense that our current inventory of greenhouse gas emissions is in some way inadequate? Um, and so that's why this is an assigned task for it's just for the sake of completeness that they should visit that protocol and make sure it's sufficient or something like that. My sense was not that there's a feeling of inadequacy, but it was more how you expressed it, a uh, completeness. But I'm also hesitant to try to uh, read the minds of the <laughs> member of another committee or another body. Sure. Um, if you wish, I would strongly encourage you to hear from the chair of House Energy, who's very involved in this, very knowledgeable, and I'm sure you can answer your questions very well. Great, thank you. Uh, Page Mr. nine. Chair. Uh, yes, please. That's Senator Campion, or Mr. Mc Senator McDonald. Um, I I flipped ahead to page eighteen because I was going to wait until then. But this has a question having to do with the meetings of this advisory panel chaired by the Secretary of Administration. Um, does the panel? How was the panel meet if the Secretary of Administration might be busy and choose not to call the panel together? What are the provisions in the law for such an event? I have a question, question about format. When you say, Mr. Chair, are you asking the chair to answer that? Or are you just, are you really asking me to no, answer I'm, it? And just... I'm directing my, my, I'm asking a, Luke, if, if you could please answer Great. that. Great, I'm sure. I, I got stuck on protocol. <laughs> no, no problem. Um, There is a mechanism in the bill that if the council doesn't come up with a plan, ANR still has to promulgate rules. So there is that safety, if you wish, if the council doesn't meet. Uh, you had the scenario of the chair not calling the council to meet. That's what would happen. But there's no other language about someone else convening the council or something to that effect. There is such language? No, I said I don't believe there is any such any other such language. So it's if the chair doesn't ever call the council to meet, they can't fulfill their duties, but NR would still be obligated to pursue rulemaking to achieve the mandatory greenhouse gas reductions. So that would empower the administration to choose not to call the council together and do it on their, in the way that they fashion, the administration might fashion to do it without um, having to consult with the council. Is that correct? I wouldn't phrase it that way. I wouldn't use the word empower. <laughs> I view it a little differently. Um, more of a grant the authority. Uh, the council doesn't meet. Yep, yep, leave them in the default position of whatever. Is that? Is I'm that sorry, correct? you're breaking up. So can uh, I make a suggestion? The, the, the V-SNAP pants pa panel, made of seven people, chaired by the by the commissioner of the Department of Public Service, of uh, uh, the, the Public Service Department, so excuse me. Um, if the chair did not call him a meeting, four members of the council majority could call a meeting of the Vermont State Nuclear Advisory Panel. That was the way in which the panel could operate if the chair didn't call a meeting. So there appears to be, Am I correct? There is no such mechanism in what is being proposed in this bill, or there is such a mechanism? There's no such mechanism in this bill. I'm scanning some of the later pages, and we can look at them again when we get there, but I do not believe so. Thank you. So thank you, Senator McDonald, for your uh, vigilance. So we'll uh, let's flag it and dig into it when we get there. I think you left off, Mr. Martland, on page nine, sub C. Yes, thank you. So C, now we're moving on to language concerning subcommittees. 
There are four subcommittees that are required, and I'll go through the mission of each of those subcommittees in a moment. But the council can establish other subcommittees if it so wishes. And you'll notice at the bottom of page nine, continuing on to the top of page 10, there's language stating that the council may appoint members of the council to serve as members of the subcommittee and also appoint individuals who are not members of the council to serve on the subcommittees. So they have authority to create other subcommittees and to appoint folks who aren't members of the council to those subcommittees. The first mandatory subcommittee is on page 10, number one, the Rural Resilience and Adaption Subcommittee, Adaptation Subcommittee, excuse me. And it states that that committee, subcommittee shall focus on the pressures that climate change adaptation will impose on rural transportation, electricity, housing, emergency services, and communication infrastructure, and the difficulty of rural communities in meeting the needs of its citizens. Proceeding on page 10, you'll see that the subcommittee shall develop a vulnerability index. Under B, develop best practice recommendations specific to rural communities for reducing municipal, school district, and residential fossil fuel consumption and other issues. C, recommend a means to securely share information concerning vulnerable residents with emergency responders and utilities. Proceeding to page 11 D, recommend tools for municipalities to assess their climate emergency preparedness. And under E, utilize Vermont emergency management reports to recommend programs and policies. And those reports will be referred to in a moment when we get to page 14. So those are the duties and deliverables of the Rural Resilience and Adaptation Subcommittee. On page 11, number two is the next mandatory subcommittee. It's the Cross Sector Mitigation Subcommittee. And number two states that this subcommittee shall focus on identifying the most scientifically and technologically feasible strategies and programs that will result in the largest possible greenhouse gas emissions reductions in the most cost effective manner. So once again, this is the idea of the biggest bang for the buck. Number three, the third mandatory subcommittee is the just transition subcommittee. And this subcommittee shall focus on ensuring that strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to build resilience shall benefit and support all residents of the state fairly and equitably. And the subcommittee shall ensure that the strategies consider the impact of climate change on rural, low income and other marginalized communities. Proceeding to page 12, at the top, number four, is the fourth mandatory subcommittee. And this is the Agriculture and Ecosystems Subcommittee. And it states that this subcommittee shall focus on Vermont's natural and working lands and the role they play in carbon sequestration and storage, climate adaptation, and community resilience. So that is a summary of the four required subcommittees and their missions. Are there any questions about those issues? Proceeding on page 12. Um, I'm a little slow sometimes here. Sorry, I'm page, going page, too quickly. No, no, it, um, page 11. So uh, the phrase dis disproportionate impact, is there, um, I'm just trying to understand how we know what's meant by that, you know, as measured how, by whom kind of a thing. Is, is that addressed later in the bill or is it just considered a fact? Are you asking how it's measured or how the house committee determined that this was an issue? Uh, maybe both. And, and maybe it's not appropriate for me to ask you to explain it. It'd be more a question for a member of that committee. There was definitely a discussion of this issue in um, some length in the committee. 
but I think it is more appropriate to circle back to the chair or another member of the committee about um, why they thought it was important or how they arrived at that decision. I don't want to paraphrase their thought process. Sure. Thank you very much. Any other questions about the subcommittees? Proceeding on to page 12, under D, in the middle of the page, it states that the council shall recommend necessary legislation to the General Assembly concerning under number four, any matter the council deals uh, deems appropriate, but under one, two, and three, issues such as adapting a market-based or alternative compliance mechanism, two, changes to land use and development, three, any statutory changes necessary to implement the plan. So the council has the ability to recommend legislative changes that it deems appropriate. Under E, there's language that I will not read through, but there's language concerning the administrative, technical and legal support of the council. And this will be provided by ANR and the Department of Public Service. Under F, there's language concerning a quorum and voting. And it does authorize the council in the middle of page 13 to adopt any other procedural rules it deems necessary to perform its work. Under G, there's language concerning per diems that is pretty standard for most study committees and other similar bodies. And under H at the bottom of page 13, there's language concerning staggering the terms of the members and the length of those terms and how vacancies will be filled. So I can pause here and give you a chance to look at that language or I can go through it in more detail if you wish, but most of this language is fairly standard or has been used in other contexts. Do you want me to pause or run through it or should I proceed? I'm okay with proceeding. Okay. And as I said earlier, I assume that this is only the initial higher level walkthrough and we can always go back and drill down on any section of the bill as you think best. Great. So um, going on to- let's, let's keep going as you suggest. Did you want me to, do you want to stop for a moment and go back? No, I think it sounds, I don't see any committee questions. So let's keep proceeding, thanks. Okay. Page 14 under I, there's reporting requirements. And the first requirement is that the council on or before January 15th of 2021 and every year thereafter will report to the General Assembly concerning its activities and the state's progress towards meeting the greenhouse gas reduction requirements. So the council has a reporting requirement every year. Secondly, you'll see in the middle of the page on or before November 1st, 2021, and every second year thereafter, the Director of Emergency Management will report to the Council concerning Vermont's overall municipal resilience to increased hazards presented by climate change. If you remember a few, pager, few pages earlier, in the one of the subcommittees, there's language about this report. So this is a report from Emergency Management to the Council <laughs> to help guide its work concerning resilience. That is the conclusion of section 592 concerning the council and its duties and structure and obligations. I'm about to move on to 592 concerning the climate action plan. Any questions before I do so? So 592 starts on page 14 towards the bottom, and this is the Vermont Climate Action Plan. A requires that on or before December 1st, 2021, the Climate Council adopt a climate action plan and update it every four years. Now, You'll see, and we'll go through each of these in some detail. So we'll, we'll walk through the next few pages of the bill, but 
The specific initiatives, programs, and strategies to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions will include under B, initiatives and programs and strategies that achieve seven sort of higher level goals. C then sets forth the basis for developing those initiatives, programs, and strategies. And under subsection D, there's additional language concerning more specific objectives that should be achieved by those initiatives, programs, and strategies. So let's now go back and begin to walk through subsections B, C, and D. B starts at the bottom of page 14, and it says that the plan, which of course is adopted by the council, shall set forth the specific initiatives, programs, and strategies, including regulatory and legislative changes necessary, necessary to achieve the state's greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirements and to build resilience to prepare the state's communities, infrastructure, and economy to adapt to the current and anticipated effects of climate change. The plan shall include specific initiatives, programs, and strategies that will, and you'll see that there's seven listed higher level goals. Number one, reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation, building, regulated utility, industrial, commercial, and agricultural sectors. Two, encourage smart growth and related strategies. Three, achieve long-term sequestration and storage of carbon and promote best management practices to further climate mitigation. Four, achieve net zero emissions by 2050 across all sectors. So if you remember when we were going through section 578, which established the mandatory greenhouse gas reduction targets, I had mentioned to you that later on in the bill, we'll touch on net zero. This is the first time we've seen that term used and the plan must include strategies and programs to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 across all sectors. Five, reduce energy burdens for rural and marginalized communities. Six, limit the use of chemicals, substances and products that contribute to climate change. And seven, build and encourage climate adaptation and resilience of communities and natural systems. So these are the seven higher level goals that the plan must further. Under C, now we're moving on to the basis for developing these higher level goals. And C states that the analysis, development, and selection of the initiatives, programs, and strategies contained in the plan shall be based upon, number one at the bottom of page 15, the council's analysis and evaluation of the strategies and programs. And there's a cross reference that goes back to page seven and eight. That's a language when we were looking at the section of law concerning the council and the council's duties and deliverables. Flipping to page 16, two reports, plans and information from ANR, Department of Public Service, other state agencies, and the state comprehensive energy plan so this is saying that the plans, strategies, and initiatives and programs to achieve these seven high level goals are based upon information from various state agencies and entities. And number three, other reports, plans, and information. So it's quite a broad catch all that allows the plan to be based on information from multiple sources. D on page 16 states that the specific initiatives, programs, and strategies contained in the plan and any updates to the plan shall further the following objective, objectives, excuse me. And there's eight listed on page 16, continuing on to page 17. The first number one on page 16 is to prioritize the most cost-effective technologically feasible and equitable greenhouse gas emissions reductions pathways and adaptation preparedness strategies informed by scientific and technical expertise. Number two, to provide for emissions reductions that reflect the relative contribution 
of each source or category of emissions. Three, to minimize negative impacts on rural and marginalized communities and upon low and moderate income individuals. Four, to ensure that all regions of the state benefit from emissions reductions. Five, on the top of page 17, to support economic sectors and regions of the state that may face the greatest barriers to emissions reductions, especially rural and economically distressed regions. Six, to support industries, technology, and training that will allow workers and businesses in the state to benefit from emissions reductions solutions. Seven, to support the use of natural solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and re increase resilience, including the use of working lands to sequester and store carbon and protect against severe weather. And eight, to maximize the state's involvement in interstate and regional initiatives and programs designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build upon those partnerships. So once again, we're walking through what the plan must contain or the objectives it must further. And we've seen under B that the plan must include specific initiatives, programs, and strategies that achieve seven higher level goals. In C, we talked about the basis or the information sources for determining those initiatives. And now we've just gone through subsection D, which states that the plan must further eight more specific objectives. And we've just walked through those. Any questions about this structure and these objectives or this process? Proceeding to E, towards the bottom of page 17. Now we're moving on to language concerning rulemaking. And E states the plan shall form the basis for the rules adopted by the Secretary of Natural Resources pursuant to section 593, which we'll get to in a moment. And Senator McDonald, this is the language I cross-referenced earlier. It states, if the council mm -hmm. fails to adapt the plan or update the plan as required, the Secretary of ANR shall proceed with rulemaking to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions required in a cross-references section 578. And you'll see similar language in a moment on page 21. So even if the council fails to fulfill its duties, fails to come up with the required plan, ANR must proceed with rulemaking to achieve those mandatory greenhouse gas reduction targets. And question. Just McDonald. In the event that that um, Luke has just brought to us, uh, we we have problems now. With, for example, the Vermont telecommunication plan that's supposed to be in place does not exist, and the committee put together to propose it and put one in place has failed. Um, and there is no plan and there hasn't been a plan, it's overdue. And now as we speak, the commissioner of the Department of Public Service is, um, is crafting a, a plan that comes as a result of what she, what the commissioner believes ought to happen and it's being put together um, independently from the way the law was crafted to have a plan. And this is causing consternation. I, and that will be resolved somehow. So having said all that, um, how is what is before us different? Um, than what we had in place, we, we believed we had in place to get and be able to work on a telecommunications plan. How is this different? Where do we, where does this plan permit the majority to act 
in the absence of um, administration, administrative enthusiasm. Um, Mr. Martland, do you have anything you want to say in response? Well, it sounds like more of a statement than a question. I mean, I think you're advocating for potential changes to the bill. I, I can't answer your question. Okay. Um, so thanks, Senator McDonald. I mean, that is the, occasionally planning groups run into uh, issues around getting a plan done. And uh, sometimes we are left hamstrung for, uh, can be years. So, um, okay. So thank you for flagging that. Something for us to, to come back to. Um, if there are not more questions on page 17, then I would ask Mr. Martland to uh, continue. We've looked at the sections of the bill concerning the council. We've looked at the section of the bill concerning the plan, and now we're going to proceed to the next section of the bill concerning the rulemaking process. So this is on page 18. You'll see at the top it says section 593 rules. And I'll walk through this, but at the very end of my presentation, I have a slide with a list of potential other issues or topics that the committee may want a more in-depth discussion concerning and the rulemaking process and the limits to the process and also the extent of authority given to ANR under this bill may be an issue that you want to drill down on in the future. But let me for right now go through the language in the bill concerning the rulemaking process. So what section 593 does is it mandates that ANR will adopt rules that are consistent with the initiatives, programs and strategies set forth in the plan and also develop a detailed record as to its process. And then it sets forth various time periods to adopt and update those rules that are tied to the greenhouse gas reduction years of 2025, 2026, and 2040. I'm sorry, 2025, 2030, and 2050. There's also language concerning an alternative reduction mechanism and then there's language similar to language we just looked at about ANR's duty to proceed with rulemaking even if the council fails to adopt a plan. So that's the overall structure of section 593 that begins on page 18. Let's now go to page 18 and walk through this language. Under A, it states that the secretary of ANR shall adopt rules pursuant, and there's a cross-reference to 3 VSA chapter 25. That's the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act consistent with Vermont Climate Action Plan. So it has to be, quote, consistent with, but it doesn't mandate that it follows the Climate Action Plan as to every specific detail. In adopting rules pursuant to this section, the secretary shall, number one, ensure that the rules are consistent with the specific initiatives, programs, and strategies set forth in the plan, follow the Vermont Climate Council's guidance and further the objectives pursuant to subsection 592D of this chapter. Two, develop a detailed record containing facts, data, and legal scientific and technical information sufficient to establish a reasonable basis to believe that the rules shall achieve the state greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirements. This detailed record shall be included with the rule and filed with the Secretary of State. So this is a little unusual and different than some rulemaking requirements in that ANR is mandated to develop and file a detailed record that establishes the basis for what it will seek to include in the rules. And this record is relevant later when we look at the cause of action section of the law, of the bill, excuse me. B at the bottom of page 18. Now we're moving on to the targets for greenhouse gas reduction and when the rules need to be adopted to meet each of those target years. 
So B states that on or before December 1st, 2022, the secretary shall adopt and implement rules consistent with the initiatives, et cetera, to achieve the 2025 greenhouse gas emissions reductions. So if you remember, we had the timeframes of 2025, 2030, and 2050 for guaranteed or uh, required emissions reductions. B states that on or before December 1st, 2022, ANR will have adopted rules to achieve the reductions mandated by 2025. C, the secretary shall conduct public hearings across the state concerning the proposed rules, and the secretary shall conduct a portion of those hearings in areas and communities that have the most significant exposure to the impacts of climate change. And if in the future, this committee wants to drill down on the rulemaking process, there's other requirements concerning the rulemaking process set forth in chapter 25 of title three, the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act. So this, those requirements still would be in effect. This supplements those requirements set forth in title three. Right. So I would, I would like to flag that as a, section I know that we'll want to uh, revisit. Um, it, I'm not familiar with and but it, Senator Bray, I don't know if you can hear me, but we just lost you. I couldn't hear the last sentence you said. Senator Bray, I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you. Chris, let me give him a call. Should we just pause or should I? Yeah, I think we just pause and I'll sure. call him. Yeah, he's showing that he's not muted, at least on my screen. Oh no. He's not, he's disconnected right now. Luke, I may have to. Oh, here he is. There he is. Why, thank you. Hey, Chris, we just adjourned, but do you want to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the last, the last 10 pages, I wasn't <laughs> easy, easy reading. So, so thanks. Um, my question was just, you know, the, my, the fundamental as I've learned it is that the sole lawmaking body in government is the legislature, except for when we delegate um, to agencies through the process we generally call rulemaking. And there is a, an obligation on the part of the legislature, the rulemaking body, to delegate that authority with adequate direction. And I'm just wondering about the issue of creating a non-legislative panel that then provides the guidance that the, the rulemaking must be carried out under. And um, I, um, I don't know of a precedent for that, that level of, um, I, I guess I'd call it. I think that's a legitimate issue to discuss. It was an issue that was discussed in depth in the house committees. And um, I think you put your finger on a good issue to be looked at in greater depth. And okay. uh, we can certainly do that uh, for this committee. Okay, so let's just plan on returning to that part. Sure. Senator McDonald. Um, Mr. Chair, the, your, your point is on target and on the other end of, the, uh, of that spectrum is when the legislature creates a group to come up with a plan and the group doesn't come up with that plan and the default position is that the administration then goes ahead 
and does rules that they feel they have the authority to promulgate in the absence of a plan. So it, it it's it's a danger. It, it, it has risks on both ends. And um, so I, as we go forward, I look to see that it, how we might mitigate those and keep and keep any planning um, from escaping in either direction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the reminder, right? There's more than uh, one way to have some challenges. And, and I know that um, as an experience of serving at LCAR, it's made me much more attentive to how we invoke rulemaking because sometimes I think we uh, invoke that rulemaking with scant direction and I don't know that it's always appropriate. So um, thanks for that and Mr. Martland. So we'll flag this as a major subtopic to come back to, thank you. Thank you. We're now on page 19, subsection D. It states that the secretary shall on or before July 1st, 2024 review and if necessary, update the rules required to ensure that the 2025 emissions reduction requirements are achieved. So if you remember, we just covered on page 18, the requirement that on or before December 1st, 2022, rules must be adopted to achieve those reduction requirements by 2025. This requires that on July 1st, 2024, the secretary look to see if those rules need to be updated to achieve that requirement. E, so we've looked at the 2025 reduction requirement. Now in E, we're moving on to the 2030 reduction requirement. And E states that on or before July 1st, 2026, the secretary shall adopt and implement rules consistent with the initiatives and programs set forth in the plan to achieve the 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirements. It also states that the secretary shall observe the requirements in subsection C. That was a subsection that required public hearings, including in areas of the state that were most significantly exposed to the adverse impacts of climate change. Uh, Mr. Martling, can I ask a little bit about this? So in sub D, for instance, this first target, uh, the secretary on or before July 1 of 24 reviews um, in order that the 20, to ensure that we're basically on uh, going to meet a 2025 greenhouse gas reduction requirement. So is that, I'm just trying to understand the kind of the mechanics and thinking behind this. We haven't yet hit the milestone. So are we going to be estimating that we're trending towards meeting it and or what's the what's the what's the construct how does this work if we haven't hit a milestone how do we know how do we ask the question ahead of time to see if we're on a trend line to get there yes so okay. the, the construct is and you'll see this for each of the required reduction years 2025 2030 and 2050 there's language requiring nr to promulgate the rules to meet those required reductions and then before you get to that year, look to see if the rules will be successful or not and update them if necessary. I think the assumption is that is that you could look at the data that's come in so far, could engage in modeling and see if ANR thinks it's on a path to achieve the required reduction or not and make necessary changes if it is not. Okay. Um, it is, these are very tight timeframes. Yeah. Um, did the committee discuss the timeliness of the data that's available to uh, make these kinds of assessments? My, off the, yes. off the top of my head, I think we tend to have data that's lagging two or three years behind because of the way EIA collects data versus how it gets integrated into the state data. And, where we have lagging, our data lags by several years, so. That was an issue discussed. You are correct that that might be a potential um, problem. It was discussed in committee and um, I'll just leave it at that. But there was a discussion of the data when it comes in 
and when you'd have it available. Thank you. Going to page 19 E. Now we're going to start dealing with the 2030 greenhouse gas reduction requirement. And it's very similar to the language we looked at a moment ago. E states that on or before July 1st, 2026, NR will adopt and implement rules consistent with the initiatives and programs set forth in the plan to achieve the 2030 greenhouse gas emissions reduction requirements. And it also states that the secretary will observe the requirements of subsection C, that is a public hearing requirement. Then in F, it says the secretary shall no less frequently than once every two years between 2026 and 2030, review and if necessary, update the rules to achieve the reduction requirements for 2030. G, now we're moving on to the 2050 reduction requirement. G states an honor before July 1st, 2040, the secretary shall adopt and implement rules consistent with the initiatives and programs set forth in the plan to achieve uh, the emissions reductions for 2050. And then in H, there's language similar to what we just looked at, saying that the secretary shall uh, at his or her discretion, but no less frequently than every two years between 2040 and 2050, review and if necessary, update date the rules to ensure that the 2050 reduction requirement is met. So for each of the threshold years, 2025, 2030, and 2050, there's similar language about what ANR must do, but obviously for the first two, 2025 and 2030, the time frame is much more compressed. Since we're in the weeds on this a little bit, um, the secretary is revising the rules in order to try to make sure that we're gonna hit the targets. Um, how is the um, plan, the planning uh, and guidance from the climate action panel feeding in to this rewrite of the rules. Does that come up later or has that already been addressed by what we already went through? Well, the language we just looked at, they're, they're supposed to be working together and communicating. At least that's the assumption in the bill. So you'll see, for example, on, um, I'm trying to find the language. I mean, I see that if you look on the bottom page 19, yeah. bottom page 20, and that's repeated in the prior subsections, it says that the secretary shall adopt and imp implement rules consistent with the initiative programs and strategies set forth in the plan in the top of page 20 and updates to the plan. So the council's meeting, developing its first plan, then it's periodically updating that. That should inform what ANR is also doing, developing its rules and then looking at its rules and updating them if necessary to see that they are achieving the mandatory greenhouse gas reductions. Great, thank you. So we've looked at the process or the timeframes for ANR to promulgate rules and update them if necessary to achieve the reduction requirements. Now on page 20 in I, we're gonna move on to the alternative reduction mechanisms. Before I do that, any other questions about the rulemaking deadlines tied to the greenhouse gas reduction targets. Okay. No, so, but, but from, it, from this, the rule, the plan is the first milepost. And everything that we just look at next will, is based on the assumption that there is a plan in place. Is that correct? Not entirely. I mean, yes, I think the assumption in the bill is that there will be, the council will meet and the council will fulfill its duties and come up with a plan and update it periodically. So I think that is the assumption in the bill. But remember also a &R, if that doesn't happen, a &R still must proceed with rulemaking to achieve those reduction requirements. Thank you. So looking at I in the middle of page 20, 
it states that the secretary may, so it's not shall, it's not required, may establish alternative reduction mechanisms to be used if necessary to achieve net zero emissions after 2050. So this is the second mention of net zero after 2050. Number one, the use of alternative reduction mechanisms shall account for not more than 20% of statewide emissions estimated as a percent percentage of 1990 emissions. So in essence, it's a cap on the extent of such an alternative reduction mechanism if the secretary establishes one. Number two, the secretary shall verify that any emissions offsets authorized as alternative reduction mechanisms represent equivalent emissions reductions or carbon sequestration that are real, additional, verifiable, enforceable, and permanent. So this language is seeking to ensure that if there is such an alternative reduction mechanism, the impacts are real, verifiable, enforceable, and permanent. The net zero um, emissions requirement that the first cross reference to that is on page 15 sub four. Um, because that's not established as a, uh, a group, well, I'm trying to understand whether that is an aspirational statement or if having a plan for it makes it binding. It's a little bit in between, I think. So on page 15, it is required that the plan will set forth initiatives and programs and strategies that will achieve net zero emissions by 2050. So the plan has to contain that. But it, there's no mandate that the rules that ANR promulgates also have to achieve that. The rules are guided by what's in the plan, but there's no requirement that as to everything in the plan that be reflected in the rules. So there's no requirement that the rules will achieve or must achieve net zero by 2050. Okay. The language pertaining to the rules is what we just reviewed on page 20, which says the secretary may establish such mechanisms if he or she deems appropriate. Okay, so I'm, I just wanna make sure I was, it is distinct, it's distinguished from writing the emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions targets into law, uh, in that this is a statement that the plan shall contain provisions designed to achieve that, but there's not actually a hard statutory requirement for the secretary to write plans to achieve it, nor is there a mandate for Vermont to conduct itself in a manner to achieve that. So I, it sounds somewhat aspirational. Not I, think how you, I just want to make sure I, I'm seeing a difference that correctly. I think you summarized it well. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to page 21. This is language similar to what we looked at earlier, that if the council fails to adopt or update the plan, the secretaries shall adopt rules to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirement. We've talked about this a number of times. Then in K and L, there's further language. Perhaps this language may not be necessary, but it does clarify two issues. Number one, <clears throat> excuse me, K states that nothing in this section shall be construed to limit existing authority of a state agency, department, or entity to regulate greenhouse gas emissions and to seek to address climate change. So it doesn't take away any authority of any state agency or entity to fulfill its duties to seek to address climate change. And in L, it states that the General Assembly may repeal, revise, and modify any rule or amendment to any rule, and its action shall not be abridged, 
enlarged or modified by subsequent rule. This is on one hand, a statement of the obvious that the General Assembly, if it does not like a rule, can rescind that rule, change that rule, modify that rule through an act of legislation. But it is based on language taken from 12 VSA section one concerning the authority of the judicial branch to promulgate rules. And this language is in that section of law and indicates that the General Assembly can take action to repeal, revise, or modify any rule that the judicial branch promulgates. So it, on one hand, may be a statement of the obvious, but on the other hand, is based on law in another context to make clear that the General Assembly still has authority to override a rule it may not agree with. Which, 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 of course, in many cases would um, all, that if the, the General Assembly would have to would be subject to being vetoed. Um, in the other way, something might be thwarted is through the courts. If the courts found that there was, um, those are the two exceptions. Otherwise, it's is that big picture accurate statement? Veto is absolutely accurate. And of course, the law would have to go through both bodies and be passed by both bodies and presented to the governor. And he or she could veto that bill. You're absolutely correct. Your statement about the courts, I didn't quite understand. I think if the law was unconstitutional, a court might invalidate it. But I'm not certain otherwise the courts would take action against a law that seeks to modify a rule. Could you explain that a little more? No, no, the, uh, the, the other way in which the unlimited authority of the existing authority of the state agencies would be that a rule was promulgated and put into place and it was taken to court and the rule was found to be invalid. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes, you so, are correct, and we're actually just about to talk so those, about that. In the in the event that the council doesn't provide a plan and that first mile post, and the administration does its best in the absence of a plan to do what it thinks is the right thing to do, it can only be thwarted by a law that gets passed by Congress or a court action that says what they're doing is beyond the law. That's accurate. I, uh, you misspoke and said Congress. I think you meant the uh, General Assembly of Vermont. I did. Thank yes. You. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So that, thank you. That yes. helps me look from above and, uh, and see where the defenses and guardrails are. Thank you. Yes. And we're just about to talk about the cause of action. The one thing I would add, I, I think you, I know you know this and I think you assumed it is obviously LCAR is also part of that process but LCAR doesn't object to a rule merely on policy basis, as you well know. It would have to object on some other basis, which is somewhat limited. But LCAR could also be a guardrail in that process. LCAR can sound a warning, but LCAR cannot stop a rule. Understood. I'm now ready to go on to section 594, the cause of action. Before I do that, are there any questions about we've just what we've just covered, which is section 593 and the rulemaking process? Sure, I just, um, I'm looking at K and L. Mm -hmm. So K is basically an acknowledgement that there's already pre-existing programs, agencies, departments, whatever, all these people working in other ways. And they're, they're not somehow uh, constrained in their work because there's now going to be a sort of a parallel process going on. Is that that is that is accurate? Um, and L is I don't think I've ever seen that before. So that's a reminder of just the facts of current law. I mean, was that sort of a a, a comfort clause? Well, as I said, it, it's somewhat a statement of the obvious. It may not be entirely necessary, but it was, I believe, included to make clear that the General Assembly has that authority 
and can take action if it disagrees with a rule. Sure. Okay. Thank I don't you. think there's any harm in including it. I don't think it yeah, yeah. Uh, has a negative impact in any way. Um, uh, in K, I'm noticing it says promulgate rules. And I, on, Gov, on my GovOps committee, we were just doing a technical amendments bill. I, I'll double check. I think um, Councilor Carby was saying that the state's moving to adopting rules and no longer saying promulgate just as an FYI, and I'll okay. double check on my end. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions before we move on to Section 594, the cause of action? Okay. So the next section of the bill, and we're getting through the, the real meat of the bill. After we get through this section, the rest of it might be a little quicker. This is Section 594 on page 21, the cause of action. Now, this is another topic that the committee might want to discuss in more depth, and I'm glad to do that. Um, there are, under existing law, uh, various mechanisms to challenge a rule. And um, I think those existing mechanisms would apply to this bill, even if you did not have Section 594. So there are existing ways to challenge a rule, but what section 594 does is in essence, build on that or clarify that. And so let's walk through the language in this section, but this is something that um, at another time, uh, I can come back before this committee and we can talk about it in more depth. So A on page, 21 states that any person may commence an action based upon the failure of the Secretary of Natural Resources to adopt or update rules as required. So person is a defined term in Title I. It's not separately defined in this chapter, but in 1 VSA 128, person is defined as including a natural person, that's you or I, also corporations, municipalities, um, the state or subdivisions of the state and quote, any legal entity, unquote. So the understanding of person, which would apply to the use of this term in this bill is quite broad. Now, what A does, if you're looking at the PowerPoint, there's really two different scenarios set forth in section 594. A is a scenario if a &R fails to adopt rules. So it does not do its duty. And then B, which we'll get to in a moment under subsection B, is that a &R does adopt rules, but those rules fail to achieve the required greenhouse gas reductions. So there's two different scenarios and they're slightly different how they're defined in the bill. On page 21, as I just summarized for you, A states that any person may commence an action based upon the failure of a &R to adopt rules or update rules. Number one, the action shall be brought pursuant to rule 75 of the rules of civil procedure in the Superior Court of Washington County. So that's the venue in which this action must be brought. Two, the complaint shall be filed within one year after expiration of the time in which a &R was required to adopt rules pursuant to section 593 of this chapter, the section we just walked through. However, a person shall not commence an action, and I've now turned to the top of page 22, until at least 60 days after providing notice of the alleged violation to the secretary. So this is a time frame, but also includes the requirement that the person gives notice and therefore an opportunity to cure to a and &R. Three, if the court finds that the secretary has failed to adopt or update rules, the court shall enter an order directing the secretary to adopt or update rules. If the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action to adopt or update the rules, the court may grant a reasonable period of time to do so. So the way 
subsection A is structured is that a co complaint can be filed within one year of the expiration of time in which ANR should have adopted rules. However, before commencing the action, the person shall um, give notice to ANR. The remedies are if the court finds that ANR has failed to adopt or update rules, it will order ANR to do so. However, if the court finds that the ANR is taking prompt and effective action to update the rules or adopt the rules, it may grant an extension. So, in essence, if notice is filed that ANR hasn't updated or adopted its rules and it then begins to try to do so, it could be given an extension by the court. Is that reasonably clear to everyone? Yeah. So, I know it's a little dense, but. Yeah, well, so is, is the effect of court action the same? Either they're given an extension to finish the rulemaking they're engaged in, or they're given a, a new deadline uh, by which they must complete the rulemaking. Either way, yes. there's certainty about, near certainty about getting a rule. Okay. You are correct. They're, they're either told by the court, you shall adopt rules if they fail to do so. But in essence, they'll be given a window to cure that deficiency to try to adopt rules. And if the court finds that they are taking prompt and effective action to do so, the court can give them an extension to do so. No problem there. Okay. Moving on to B. So this is the other scenario in which ANR does adopt rules, but those rules aren't reducing greenhouse gas emissions sufficiently. So B states, any person may commence an action alleging that rules adopted have failed to achieve the greenhouse gas emissions requirements, and there's a cross-reference. Number one, the action will be brought in Washington County Superior Court. Number two, the complaint shall be filed within one year after the Vermont Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory published by ANR pursuant to Section 582 indicates that the rules adopted by the Secretary have failed to achieve the emissions reductions requirements. However, a person shall not commence an action until at least 60 days after providing notice. So the trigger for this action, if you will, is that the emissions inventory indicates that the rules are not achieving sufficient reductions, but before proceeding, the person must give notice to a and Under, did you have a question? Yes, please. So the first milestone is the 2025 milestone, correct? And yes. the inventory tends to lag two to three years. So practically speaking, does this mean that there could not be such a complaint filed probably until something like 2025 plus two to three years, uh, 2027, 2028, that would be the first time that this test might be applied. It's possible. The first two milestones are, it's very compressed timeline. So you're going back to the issue of the lag in the data about emissions and what impact that could have. It might make it very difficult, if not impossible, to proceed under this subsection. Uh, thank you. Proceeding to the top of page 23, number three, it states, if the court finds that the rules adopted by the secretary are a quote, substantial cause of failure to achieve the emissions reductions requirements, unquote, unquote, the court shall enter an order remanding the matter to the secretary to adopt or update rules that achieve the reductions required. If the court finds that the secretary is taking prompt and effective action, the court may grant a reasonable period of time to do so. So the remedy in this 
second scenario under B is if the court finds that the rules are a quote substantial cause of failure unquote to achieve the required reduction, the court enters an order basically sending the matter back to ANR to adopt or update its rules to make sure that they do achieve the required greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And can I ask about this one too? I mean, I don't know if in the development of this bill, you heard testimony, talk, reviewed history, et cetera. Um, the remedy in a certain way makes sense, you know, uh, telling someone to try again on writing rules. If they failed to achieve it the first time, it also presents sort of the obvious question of why will they do better the second time? Um, do you, so we can ask the other committee about that, but in, in developing the bill, did you look at precedents where, yes, some a uh, agency was sent back to rewrite rules and second time around, they were um, successful? I don't have any knowledge of such examples, but I was not in the committee all the time. So I don't know if there was a discussion of that or a witness who testified about that. I can't say what the precedent is. I'm sorry, I just don't know. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair. Senator McDonald. So this section three seems to be a remedy to the following three scenarios. Um, all three assume that a plan has been put forth. First scenario it was a bad plan and it, it resulted in bad rules. The second one is um, the rules that were adopted simply were not um, followed. And the, the third one was that the administration um, was, uh, didn't enforce the rules and was busy and found other things more important. Is that basically what we could expect the court would be, those are the things the court would be looking at. Once again, you're asking me that question or the chair? Um, I'm always directing questions. Good, to gotcha. The, the witness, please explain. Thank you. <laughs> or please comment. Thank you. And I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot two of your three scenarios. I apologize. Well, the fault. The court would find that what has been called for in statute is not happening. And yes. it could be that the plan that was assembled was just a terrible plan and the rules reflected that. Or the court could find that um that the plan that the rules that were adopted didn't follow the plan, and that's why things are not progressing as the law calls for. Or three, the um the rules, the plan was just fine, the rules were just fine and the administration was preoccupied or, or thought more things were more important and was not enforcing the rules. Is that those the things the court can find or is there something else? Um, th those all seem uh, reasonable and they would fall within subsection B, but the language is written a little more broadly. So the well, language... that was my next question. So it's, you see under three in the top of page 23, if the court finds that the rules adopted are a substantial cause of failure to achieve the greenhouse gas reductions. So substantial cause of failure could be the scenarios you just mentioned. Um, perhaps there's another one I can't think of, but if the court finds that, then it orders a &R to promulgate better rules and to achieve those required reductions. And if ANR is continues to be busy and preoccupied with other things and finds it's not important, then what's the remedy? There's no other remedy set forth in this bill. If you look at three and you look at the other language we looked at earlier under scenario A, the remedy or result is the court telling ANR to engage in rulemaking. There's no other remedy in this bill. So the court is not um, free I, to order certain things. Well, it's free to order what's set forth in this bill. Now, if we talk another day about other options 
available to challenge rules. We can talk of the, rem the remedies under existing law, but I think most laws assume that the executive branch will obey and follow the law and do its best to comply and implement. As would we assume the planners and the legislature all do their best. Yep. Thank you. Right. So to, just to follow up briefly on Senator McDonald's last questions. So there there, there is nothing in here that's specific to um, failure to execute. So you could have that good rule, but uh, inadequate implementation, which might include inadequate uh, regulation, right? Well, I, I think that might fall within three, the language we just looked at, and it also might fall within the other remedies available under existing law. Okay. But it doesn't, it doesn't the... Um, Good rules that A and R just doesn't implement. That is not specifically spelled out in the current language. Right. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yeah, let's come back to this one. Yes, Senator McDonald. Uh, just just um, the, the this is my personal editorial opinion, but the administration is to be commended on its decision to pursue uh, climate change issues. And it's to be commended for having put together a, uh, a wide group of people to make recommendations on how to tackle climate change. They weren't made through rule, but they were made and presented to the administration and the legislature. And where Vermonters, um, it seems that the reason for this act is that the administration for perhaps has been busy on other things, but has yet to take those recommendations and put them to use. And we have, or if we haven't yet come to the point where they, we can commend the administration for having done that. So we have this, appears to have this built before us because we, the legislature or citizens perhaps are worried that we, we somehow need to prod the next step out of all the parties. So, um, that's the way I look at this bill. And it seems to, the next place where it could break down is the courts could say, the next place it could break down is there is no plan. And then following that, the courts could say, you haven't been as aggressive with the rules and go back and do it again. Is that a fair, a reasonable um, outline of where we are? Uh, you don't I, need to comment. It was editorial. Okay. okay. All right. I'm I'm looking at the clock, and I know that before we adjourn today, we're also trying to have a a vote on an amendment to two two seven, um, and we're getting near the end. So, um, Mr. Mark, I don't want to rush us. And oh, I think we're. Thank you. I think we can get through the rest of this in five minutes. So. Yeah, and I have get... a twelve o'clock that I'll have to jump off at four. And and. And Luke, when you yes, I I am Jude. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. I saw your email. Okay. Thank you for keeping us on on schedule, Mr. Chair. Yes. So let me close out this section of Law 594, and then we'll move on to some of the other sections, which we can do more quickly. You'll see that C on page 23 concerns uh, the um, what may be awarded in an action. You'll see under it says that. In an action brought pursuant to this section, a prevailing party or substantially prevailing party, number one, that is a plaintiff, so that's the person or entity suing the state, may be awarded reasonable costs if the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable basis in law or fact. I'm sorry, I was reading two. I apologize. Number one, if the prevailing party is a plaintiff, shall be, so it's mandatory, shall be awarded reasonable costs and attorney's fees unless doing so would not serve the interests of justice. And this language is taken from other statutes and tracks the language in other statutes concerning costs and fees. Number two, that is a defendant, in other words, a state, a and r may be, so it's not mandatory, it's optional, may be awarded reasonable costs, but doesn't say anything about attorney's fees, if the action was frivolous or lacked a reasonable basis in law or fact. So 
um, costs and uh, perhaps attorney's fees could be awarded to different parties, but there's enough, there, it's um, limited and there's some language about when those might be awarded. We can talk about that in more depth if we go back and look at the cause of action section in the future. And then D, it says that nothing shall be construed to limit the rights procedures under existing law. Section five, we're now gonna look quickly at, and I'm having trouble with moving ahead in my PowerPoint. Yep, so we're gonna now look at some other sections and I'll try to go through these very quickly. Um, I don't think we need to go through them line by line. On the bottom of page 23, there's session law concerning the rulemaking process. And basically what this did does, if you go to the top of page 24, is it requires ANR to provide rules and its detailed record to um, the council 45 days before it begins the formal process by filing those rules with ICAR and to provide the rules to certain House and Senate committees 30 days before filing with ICAR. So what this basically is, is a check-in, if you will, where ANR has to come to the council, go back to the council and go back to certain committees of which you are one and present those proposed rules before they begin the formal rulemaking process. So obviously the assumption is, is that the council and or the committees could give feedback to ANR, which hopefully would be incorporated in the rules before the formal process is begun. You'll see in the middle of page 24, number three, the rules have to be filed with ICAR on or before July 1st, 2022. There's also language in B about JFO either preparing or hiring someone to prepare an analysis of the economic, budgetary, and fiscal costs and benefits of the plan. Section six, concern. So, yeah, I think we're gonna wanna come back to this one. I mean, for instance, sub two, although the committee would hear about this, we don't have any authority to modify the plan. That's or, accurate. Or, or prove it, ratify it, et cetera. I mean, it's informative, but not, we don't have, other than if we were in session, we'd have the ability to change law, but, yep. okay. No, you're, you're absolutely correct, Mr. Chair. And that, that is something that we could discuss in more detail. It's a check-in, it's not a required approval. You're correct. Uh, section six has session law that simply states that the members of the council must be appointed within 60 days of the passage of the law. And um, the first meeting must be held within 30 days. So it's an effort to get the process rolling fairly quickly. Section seven and uh, concerns existing law. There is a state energy policy and a state energy plan under existing law. And all that this bill does is make sure that current law is amended to include references to the Climate Council Action Plan. Section nine on page 26 is the appropriation and positions. And it states that the sum of $972,000 is appropriated to ANR for the purposes of implementing this act. Uh, under section 10, there are three positions created to help with the implementation of the act and to help the council fulfill its duties. And then section 11 is the effective date and the, it is effective uh, upon passage. Now, there are other, I wanted to quickly put on your screen the timeframes pursuant to the bill. So this is just to give you a visual. And as you can see, the bill is effective on passage. The Climate Council meets relatively quickly. The first plan is adopted by December 1st, 2021. Yep. ANR develops the rules and then the rules are filed with ICAR. It is a very 
aggressive time frame, as you can see by what's on your screen. And did someone ask a question? Okay. And then last but not least, we've touched on a number of issues that the committee may want to hear further testimony about. They include uh, the delegation or the non-delegation doctrine, rulemaking process and limits on authority, which relates back to the non-delegation doctrine. And then more specifics about a cause of action under existing law and the language in the bill. So these are three of the topics we've already talked about in some form. And if the committee wants to discuss in greater depth, I can certainly do so. And I really appreciate everyone's time. That concludes my presentation walk through the bill. And do you have any questions? And I think Michael Grady's now joined us to discuss the other bill you wanted to consider. Hey, um, thank you so much for um, that great walkthrough. Very helpful. Um, I think in terms of the, the things you predicted on your last slide that might be topics for further discussion ended up getting flagged during our conversation as well. So um, let's uh, use that list as the basis of further discussions tomorrow. I think, you know, it was great we completed the walkthrough, but now that we've had a a look, um, I'd like to go into those. And I don't know how far we'll get, um, uh, but let's plan to start with the, the delegation question Great. tomorrow. Um, and if we have time, we could go on from something after that, but we could at least have a, I think we will end up needing to call some witnesses to discuss that one further, but um, at least tomorrow, let's have a, a little more time on each of those things you flagged. That'll be our agenda for tomorrow. Thank you. So I will, thank you very, Luke, very much. Appreciate Luke, your patience. Yep. Luke, you yep. need to remake me the host. I can't get in to be the host here. Right I now. apologize. That's okay. So I'll do that and then I will okay. sign. Great. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Martland. Um, so committee, we had- oh, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, he's still showing up as a host. Okay. Well, give me a second, Jude. I'm trying to do it. Just give me a second. Oh, okay. sorry. While this transition's happening.